Welcome to the Visual Arts ATAR Theory component. Over the following um, series of lectures, we're going to have a look at a couple of key concepts. As part of the ATAR course, you need to be able to both produce and respond to artworks with an understanding of different frameworks and the relationships that exist between them. Specifically, you need to have a solid understanding of the elements and principles of art and design, be able to identify and describe them within an artwork. You need to have an understanding of the conceptual framework, which considers the contextual factors surrounding the work. You should have a good understanding of the four frames, uh, the subjective, cultural, structural and postmodern frames, which we can think of as lenses through which we can respond to a work. And also the relationship between the artist and their practice, which refers to the ideas artists have and the actions they take to produce their artworks. Um, each of the lectures will be produced independently, so each concept will be in its own video. You should take notes as you follow me through each of these lectures um, and there will be tasks that I will give you as part of these as well. If you have any issues with any of the content, please come and see me in class. Um, there will be handouts available as well. I'll place them underneath the videos in YouTube that you can download, but I can also make them available either via email, connect or OneNote. Um, and more than happy to print them for you as well. So I just wanted to begin by acknowledging that it's important to recognise that none of the concepts that we're going to discuss operate independently of the others. They are all interlinked and interrelated, interrelated and they are all used in conjunction with each other, both to guide your response to artworks and in the production of your artworks. And so we have kind of this overarching artistic practice, which is the actions the artist takes to produce work. Within that, we have the different frames through which we can consider work, which are the structural, subjective, cultural and postmodern frames, where we look at really specific elements of the work. And at the very centre of that, we have the conceptual framework, which places the artwork at the very centre of all of these Venn diagrams and surrounding that artwork, we consider the artist, the world in which they create the artwork and the audience that responds to their work. And so you can see through this very sort of complicated overlapping series of circles that it all interrelates and interlinks. None of them are separate from each other. So the first one we're going to look at is the conceptual framework, which is really considering the context that surrounds an artwork. There's lots of, there's four different elements that we're going to look at and you're going to need to take notes as we go along. So what is the conceptual framework? The conceptual framework asks us to think about contextual factors that surround an artwork, how they impact upon an artist, and how they influence the way an audience views and interacts with a work. And that can consider the way the audience views and interacts both in the time of production and further um, down the timeline. So you have to consider that artworks are never created inside a vacuum. And like any creative work, they respond to both explicit and implicit influences. And when we talk about those influences, we're really thinking about cultural context, which is the culture that the artist lives in and what's happening in that society at that time. There are different elements of context. And so in addition to context, uh, cultural contexts, you really need to consider how an artwork may also be uh, impacted by uh, social contexts, political contexts and historical contexts or any combination of those such, such as socio-political or socio-cultural contexts and so on. When looking at any artwork, a much deeper interpretation is going to be made by having an understanding of the contexts that have informed the production of that work. It's important to have an understanding of the theory of visual communication. So if we consider this diagram, we can see that there are several layers to making an interpretation. 
at the very centre of this diagram is the visual work or the in this in our case it's an artwork but it could be any visual text anything that is visual that communicates an idea so that applies to things like posters uh, film um, television anything adverts and so on so at the very centre is that visual uh, text surrounding that is an understanding of semiotics. And semiotics means a system of understanding signs and symbols and their culturally assigned meanings. It's how we can make meaning of visual inf information. That happens through a process of signifier and signified and through a process of encoding and decoding. So a signifier is something that communicates meaning and that meaning is culturally encoded. We all accept that meaning exists. And signified is when you make that meaning or you interpret that meaning, and you do that through a pro process of decoding. So you kind of look at the code that exists and you interpret the meaning that is intended. To contextualize that for you, I'll give you a really basic example, which is the signifier is a red rose. And so, the signifier as a red rose, the rose in and of itself just is a flower, that's all it is. But it comes with its own culturally embedded meaning, which is that it's related to love and romance. And so that red rose, if you put that, put, were to put that in an artwork, it is going to signify that idea or that connotation of love or romance. And so then the sign has signified an idea, which is a culturally assigned meaning. It's also important that you have an understanding of social, historical, cultural, and perhaps political contexts. And you gain that understanding through knowing about the world by reading and viewing things to do with the world and by researching, um, obviously, in this case, artists and artworks and the time period in which they're created. It's also important that you understand that meaning is created by the viewer. Obviously, the artist um, embeds their intention in the work, but as the viewer, you bring your own personal context to the work and your interpretations are informed by those contexts, which is called context of reception. This doesn't mean that any interpretation is valid. You do have to be able to justify with evidence why you formed an interpretation. But when you're coming to a work, what you see and understand in that work will be shaped by what you know about the world. And an example of that is if you come from a culture where let's say for example, the red rose symbol is something that is commonly used in your culture as a funeral flower. So let's say you come from a culture where the red rose is a symbol of funerals. Then if you're looking at a painting that has a red rose in, in the painting as a subject, your meaning of that painting is going to differ for, than someone from a Western society where the red rose signifies love or romance, because the cultural connection that you have with that symbol is different based on cultural context. And that's an important thing just to be considerate of as well. This process of understanding signs and symbols and codes is called semiotics. Um, it's a really, it's a bit of a deep dive and it's an interesting thing to learn about if you're interested. Um, certainly worth doing a bit of a Google. So we're going to be focusing on the conceptual framework, which um, originated in the 1970s, and it is a system used in art exclusively um, to highlight and explain all of the information and ideas that consist within and about an artwork. And it provides for you a structure for organising complex information, relationships and contexts, sorry, concepts. When we talk about the conceptual framework, we're thinking of four agencies, which are artist, artwork, world, and audience. And we're gonna look closely at each of those agencies or agents, and we're gonna look at what they mean and what kind of questions we would ask when viewing the artwork from that vantage point. Each of these agencies describes an integral aspect of an artwork, and you'll use all of them when interpreting and explaining art.
You should also attempt to use them to view your own work or to shape and generate your own art making practice because you as an artist, artist or art maker, you're not operating outside of these frameworks. You're op operating within them or they are operating within your work. And so you can use these frameworks and apply them to your own practice as well. So the first thing I want you to do is to make a copy of this diagram um, and I'll tell you the word that's behind my head in a second. This is a visual representation of the conceptual framework. So at the very centre of the framework, we have the artwork that exists as its own entity. So that goes in the very centre. And then around the artwork are the three other agencies. Down in the bottom corner behind my head is the artist who created the work. On the opposite side, we've got the audience that responds to the work. And at the top, we've got the world in which that work is created or the world that rep is represented within the work. These are the four agencies. Take a moment to draw a copy of it in your visual diary or on an A3 piece of paper. And you wanna leave some space around it. So you can draw the diagram small, leave some space around it to take notes on each of the following slides. Pause the video here. And when you're ready, you can resume. Okay, so the first one is the artwork agency. We're going to look at the artwork as its own entity. We're going to consider it existing all by itself and consider what information can be gleaned from the work and perform an objective analysis, which is looking at what we can observe or infer without knowing extra context around the creation of that work. So the things that you really want to consider I've bolded them here. These are really the key things you want to be looking at the first time you look at any artwork. The first one is the title of the work. The title can give us a lot of clues as to the subject matter, the intention, the meaning. Um, sometimes it might be a boring title such as Still Life 33, in which case we might consider, well, why did they do so many? But maybe the title doesn't give us a lot of information itself. We want to look at the date that the artwork was produced. That's going to tell us just on our, from our own understanding what kind of world it was produced in. We know that the world in 19, sorry, in 1555 was very different to the world in 2023, for example. We want to know what kind of medium was used. And so usually artworks are reproduced online or in books with the medium, such as oil on canvas or um, bronze. Um, so what medium is used to make it? If you can't find that information, look at the work and think about what does it look like it's made out of? We want to consider what type of work it is or what genre of work it is, um, which includes painting, sculpture, digital, printmaking, drawing, and so on. We also want to consider um, under that heading is, does it appear to belong to a specific art movement such as the Renaissance or Impressionism or Modernism or Neo-Expressionism? Finally, we want to consider the subject matter. What is depicted in this work? What can we actually see? What is it a painting or a artwork of? So, you know, is it a still life? Is it a landscape? Is it a portrait? Um, what kind of scene is depicted in that work? The next step is to look at the formal qualities of the work, which is the composition. The composition asks us to think about the elements and principles that have been used and how they've been used and what kind of effect that has, how they're all arranged within the frame itself. This is called an objective analysis. So we're not applying any feelings at this point. We're just looking at what kind of line has the artist used and what kind of mood does that convey? How have they used colour? Is there a lot of colour? Is it bright, bold colour or is it subdued colour? Is it monochromatic? Are they analogous colours? So we're really thinking about those 14 elements and principles of design, um, art and design. We want to think about the mood of the work or the feeling that we get immediately when we look at the work. And obviously when we think about mood, we are thinking about the elements and principles. We're thinking about what kind of marks are made, what kind of colours are used and how that creates a feeling. And we want to think about like what is that feeling that we're being asked to have. Sometimes the feeling might be an immediate response and sometimes the feeling might be through those elements and principles. 
And finally, we can think about what might have influenced the artwork and what it is about. For example, um, is it depicting a scene that is recognisable from a certain time period? Um, is it depicting something um, that tells us this is a painting about World War II? Or is it depicting something that's telling us this is an artwork about coronavirus? So we're kind of drawing on our own knowledge and our own response, looking at the artwork all by itself without knowing anything about the artists themselves of what we think might have influenced the creation of this work. So further to that, we can think about artworks as objects that are intentionally made by artists. They are constructed to have material and physical form. They're traditionally described by the materials and techniques from which they are created. They can include art, craft, design, architecture, 2D, 3D, and even 4D, which is time and video and sound based works. We can look at artworks as being a representation of ideas, of personal responses, of cultural views, of symbolic interpretations, and we can think about whether or not they challenge conventional notions of art objects. Some key questions to ask when you're thinking about an artwork from just the artwork agent is what is this artwork? What kind of work is it? Is it, is it a painting? Is it a sculpture? Is it an installation? Is it a drawing? Is it a uh, time-based work? What has been used to create this work? What materials? Has it been created with light and sound? Has it been created with found objects? Has it been created with oil paint and canvas? We can ask, how does it make you, the audience, feel? What kind of response are you having to this work? We can ask what kind of signs and symbols are recognisable in this work that we can see that we might be able to attach some of those um, cultural meanings to. We can ask what is the name of this artwork, when was it made and who made it? And we'll obviously talk more about who made it in the artist agent. So. When we're thinking about the artwork agency, essentially what we have is an object that shows the artist's intention and, and ideas by their own technical innovation and finesse. The artist has created the artwork and that operates as a bridge between them and the audience. The artwork object conveys ideas and conventions of the artist. The artwork is an object that is shaped by technologies of that time. And when I say technologies of that time, it could be te technological advancements in paint making. It could be digital technologies. It could be an artwork that is created in response to a new technology um, and so on. We can consider that artworks are objects that can be read just like a book for meaning. We can read these visual images, visual symbols and signs, and they communicate meaning through that process of semiotics. We can consider that the artwork might challenge or complement traditions of the art making process. We might consider, does the artwork subvert notions of what art is or should be? Does the artwork challenge ways that things should be done? Does the artwork uh, confront an audience? And we can consider that an artwork is an object that operates to reflect ideas and beliefs of a specific time and place. Okay. So the next one is the artist agency. So moving on to the artist agency, we want to add some notes. So we're going to go through and really when we're looking at the artist agency, we're now thinking about, well, the artwork exists. Now I'm going to look at who actually created this work and what can we learn about them that's going to help us understand more about that artwork. So the artist agent refers to who made the artwork, how did they make the artwork and what materials did they use? And you might notice that we already talked about materials a little bit in the artwork agent. So we're starting to see these Venn diagrams cross over and they are all interlinked. When we consider the artist, we're thinking about the environment of that artist. What is their context? We might wanna think about what style or movement the artist is associated or was associated with at the time of creating that work. 
and it's important that we look at that in relation to the work itself because especially within art history and especially within the early 20th century there were so many art movements emerging that there were a lot of artists that were um, involved with multiple art movements. Um, Matisse is a good example who was involved with post-impressionism, um, Dadaism, Fauvism, sorry not Dada, Fauvism and then um, later on um, abstract expressionism. We want to consider the artist's technical skills and processes that they've brought to the work. What have they, um, what specific, specific skills have they had to create this work? What specific processes have they used to create this work? Do they do things in their practice that are quite unusual? We also can consider at this point the artist's intentions. Why did they create this work and what semiotic codes, signs or symbols are in the work for the viewer to decode? And how do those semiotic codes align with their intended message? In the artist agency, um, the artist is referred to the one who makes the artwork. They establish the representation and intentions. They attempt to connect to the audience through their artwork. The artist is guided by their individual philosophies in art making. They have their own original process in art making. The artist develops distinctive subjective views. They are driven by their own system of beliefs and their own attitudes and their own values, and they communicate their personal experiences in their artworks. Their artwork reflects a documentation of events and ideas. Their artwork may explore media and develop new aesthetic conventions. Their, the artist is their own critical curator. They're constantly reflecting on and refining their art making. And they might be seen as visionaries who represent their ideas and beliefs in visual ways. So the artist, or the traditional function of the artist is to make artworks, whether they're images or objects. This agency really is thinking of the who, the how, and the why of art making. We can think of art practitioners as being artists, craftspeople, designers, architects. They could be individuals, they could be groups, it could be a movement. Although artists, architects and designers may have actually enlisted others to produce their work. Exhibitions are central to the activities of the artist. They can be held in a variety of locations, obviously including galleries, but also museums, private homes, uh, purpose-built venues, public sites, institutions. Artists can show their artworks as an individual or in groups. An artist practice is influenced by their accumulative experience, such as culture, education and class context. Thinking about the artist context and their relationship to things like class, gender, race, ethnicity, they're all inherent in considering um, the experiences of that artist and how those experiences have influenced their work. So questions to ask in the artist agent are, who is the artist? What do we know about them? What do we know about their age, their gender, their sexuality, their race, their ethnicity, where do they live in the world? What time did they live in? How did the artist create the work and what materials did they use? Were they using traditional techniques? Were they creating new techniques? Were they challenging techniques? Uh, were they subverting art practices? What was the artist's intention in creating that artwork? Were they intending to represent something in a new way? Were they intending to document? Were they intending to shock an audience? Were they intending to offer a commentary on something? And what influenced that artist? Was it art movements? Was it world events? Was it other artists? Was it personal experiences? And so on. The next one is the audience agency. So. When we look at the audience agent, we're considering different audiences that would view the work. We look at who the audience is and where they're witnessing the work. We can consider that both in the past when the work was made and in the present when the work might still be being viewed by contemporary audiences. 
The audience agent also considers changing contexts as well as changing societal attitudes and values. How did audiences react at the time and how does a modern audience bring different meanings, feelings and interpretations to the work? A really good example would be any work by Van Gogh. He's quite possibly the most revered artist in um, you know, the modern collective consciousness. Every single person alive knows who Van Gogh is. Yet at the time of his life, he was lauded as being untalented. People didn't like his work. He never exhibited and he barely sold any of his works, I think one in his lifetime. So we can look at how, you know, why did audiences react like that at the time? Why do we love him so much now? What has changed in that time? So if we're looking at the audience agent, we're thinking about the audience as being the people who view and, and comment on the artwork. So not just the people who go to a gallery and look at the work, but who's saying stuff about this work? And obviously in the modern era, you know, especially when a work is controversial, a lot of people will be saying stuff about it. It's going to be published online. Through history, we might think about historians and art critics who have offered commentary and it has been documented, which can reflect the thoughts and the tastes and the values of that time period. So when we think about the audience agent, it does include the general public who responded to the artwork. It can look at the audience as being potentially shocked by the artist's forms of representation. Are they challenging societal attitudes or values? And a really good example of that one is the artist David Hockney, who as a young artist emerging in his career in the 1950s, he created paintings of um, men, uh, homosexual men, um, you know, engaged in embraces. It wasn't explicit or anything, but, you know, just men sort of kissing or cuddling or in, lying in bed together. And if we think about the context of the 1950s, where we have a really traditionalist concept of the idea of love and family, and a very heteronormative concept of love and family, his works would have been very confronting to a typical audience visiting a gallery. However, if you were to put the, those same paintings in a gallery today, people probably wouldn't even think twice when looking at them. And that is because of the societal attitudes towards who can love each other has changed across the last sort of 60, 70 years or so. And so at the time, his representation of lovers was shocking to an audience, whereas that representation today is actually probably more reflecting the society that we live in. The audience includes critics who influence and govern the acceptance of an artwork. Whatever an, a critic says about an artwork, and whether that's in a newspaper or through radio or on television, like what, or social media, whatever they say, they influence the public and whether or not they're going to accept that work, whether they're going to take on that intention and that meaning. We can also consider the audience as someone who may be a stakeholder in the work. That could include people who have commissioned or sponsored the artist. Has someone put money into the creation of this work? And you know, as then an audience member with a vested interest in that work, how have they responded? Audience includes historians who place value and importance on artworks and the preservation of artworks. And it can also include a specialised audience such as museum curators and gallery curators. The function of the audience refers to the role and value of the audience as consumers and critics. The audience includes responses to art by members of the public, patrons, curators, art critics and art historians. And the responses from these audience can, audiences can each differ, change and evolve over time. It's through the audience agency that art criticism and history ar arise. Audiences can also uh, refer to institutions, both public and private, that hold influence, such as galleries, guilds, academies and collectives. When you're looking at the audience agent and you're looking at a specific 
So the questions to ask in the audience agent include, who is the intended audience? Who could this work be for? Who is it speaking to? Who might see themselves reflected in this work? Or who might respond in a certain way to this work? Where is this work being displayed and who is going there? Is it on a street in a town? Is it in a gallery that's, you know, you have to pay to get into? Um, you know, consider how different audiences are accessing that work. Are the intentions of the artist conveyed to the audience? Like, you know, if you think about who the work is made for, is that audience capable of forming in that interpretation? Has the audience changed over time? And with that, has the meaning changed with a different audience, as in the example of David Hockney's work? And how does the audience relate to or respond to the artwork? So the next one is the world agency. So when we're looking at the world agency, we're really thinking about, well, whose world is represented in this artwork? Is it the artist's personal world? Is it the physical world? Is it a spiritual world? Is it a surreal world? What do we learn about the world at the time that this artwork is being created? Was the artist influenced by worldly events and has the artist or the artwork influenced the world we live in today? One of the things to consider there is do we see um, uh, reproductions of this work uh, or do we see um, new works that appropriate this work? Um, examples of that would include uh, the Mona Lisa, which we constantly see being reappropriated. Um, and with those reappropriations, does the meaning change? How is the artist offering commentary by using that work in an appropriative manner? So the world really refer refers to the time and place where the artist, the audience and the artwork all reside at the same time as each other. So it's really, it's not thinking about the world today, although we can think about the world today, it's really thinking about the world in which that artwork was created and the artist and the audience and all of those sort of agencies intermingling with each other. So when we're looking at the world that's represented in the artwork, we're thinking about the acceptable ideas and conventions in that epoch or time period. We're thinking about historical events that may have been happening around that artwork that may even be represented in that artwork or have influenced the work. We might think about the beliefs or conventions of that period in that world and are they being represented in the artwork? We might think about technical or technological advances that have influenced the work or are represented in the work or that the work is created as a response to. Um, and technical or technological advances doesn't have to mean technology in the sense of digital. Um, technologies uh, can include things like um, you know, they discovered how to create and mass produce paint. That's new technology that's impacting the artist. Um, the World Agency involves links to what the world was going through um, and the artworks and the artists of that time. It might include fashion, politics and society of that time. And it might include, the world includes the influence of important people who shaped the processes of thought that exist at that time and the different ideological beliefs that exist at that time. So the world agency refers to all the possible things artists and audiences are interested in and what artworks can be about. It also includes a description and interpretation of aspects of the world such as time and place. When you're using the world agent, questions that you would ask include, what type of world is reflected in this artwork? How is the world represented? What comments are offered on that world? And what is happening in the artist world that has influenced this work? And can I see those things being represented? There's a document here um, for further reading. Um, and you can download a copy of this from underneath this video. You can access it via your Connect or your OneNote page, or you can um, get a printed copy from me. This document is going to give you a bit more information 
um, and it also connects the conceptual framework and those agencies of artwork, artist, audience and world and it connects them to the four frames which we will be looking at in a later lesson and it's really you know once you kind of have your head around each of those different frameworks and frames and I know we're using the word frame a lot but once you've got your head around those and you understand that they all operate not side by side but intermeshed then it's really it's, it makes it a really easy thing to look at different artworks looking at the artist the world the audience the artwork and thinking about subjective response, cultural response, structural response, postmodern response. So just to recap, today we have looked at the conceptual framework. You should have taken notes based on each of these slides under each of the headings that we've looked at. You need to understand that there are four agencies. Central to the, all of them is the artwork itself. Then we look at the artist who has created the artwork. Then we look at the audience who has responded to the artwork. And then we look at the world that is represented in that artwork. In the next lesson, we're going to apply that theory into practice where we look at a specific artwork and we look at each agency and how it is operating within that artwork to create meaning.